You're listening to The Voice of Russia with me, Juliet Spahn. Our discussion today starts with the story of Ava Rosing's death. The millionaireess was found dead in the bedroom of her £70 million Belgravia home in London on the 9th of July. The American-born 49-year-old will be remembered by the world for her drug addiction and her marriage to billionaire heir to the Tetra Pak empire, Hans Christian. Pictures of Eva in the newspapers and online almost every day range from the beautiful blonde teenager captured in the 80s to the more recent drug-addled, gaunt and frail woman pictured in the weeks leading up to her death. Taking part and joining me today for this discussion on The Voice of Russia is Dr Tim Williams, a consultant addiction psychiatrist, the Director of Communications and Information at Drugscope, Harry Shapiro, and Drugs and Policy Analyst at the Centre of Policy Studies, Cathy Gingell, and Marcus Connolly, which isn't his real name, and we've disguised his voice, who's a drug dealer and user in London. Now, according to statistics from the National Treatment Agency for Substance Misuse, there's more than 42,000 crack users in London, a figure that's only decreased marginally since 2008 and 9. So since cocaine usage in the UK has risen over the past decade, so has the availability of cocaine for which you produce crack. Tim, I'm going to come to you first. The question is, does being a billionaire make you more likely to become a drug addict? The simple answer to that is no. Um, Drug and alcohol addiction is more prevalent in people um, from poorer backgrounds. So... um, But obviously, um, the the media spotlight can be focused on someone who has so much but uh, has lost so much from um, drug or alcohol misuse. I mean, it's the media spotlight that means we're holding this discussion today. And Cathy, you've written a blog about this. What was your main point of this? I think my main point was that money was her downfall as much as her help. I mean, it's really sad in England today that there's so many addicts um, who do come from poorer backgrounds that can't ever axe rehab because it's not provided for by the state and it's expensive. Um, Ava Rousing had that opportunity many times as much as she liked. But because she came from such a wealthy family, in a way, in some ways, there were fewer restraints on her. It was almost more difficult in a curious way than if she'd been poor and she would have hit rock bottom in her life much earlier and um, probably the hard hand of the law might have come down on her and in a way she was protected from that and that's very sad. Tim can you just tell us a bit about addiction and what it must be like to be addicted to crack cocaine? Well addiction is um, a multifaceted syndrome in itself and it's fundamentally the the substance that you use, um, or even the the activity such as gambling, becomes the becomes primacy. It becomes the only focus in your life, and you therefore disregard other elements of your life, be that um, you know your employment or your family, um, those kind of things, purely to focus on your on your addiction. So, I mean, for example, with with this tragic case, um, it seems that she's become uh, you know this long-standing battle with with drugs, and she's pushed a lot of her family and her friends away who have tried to help her over the years and and very much focused on on this dependence. I I think what's most tragic about this is there seems to be a um, a dual dependence between between this couple um, and their their addictions and they seem to have have pulled each other down maybe if you if you want to use that phrase and and you you do see that with 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 groups of people who use drugs together it can be very difficult for one person to break out um, if if another person is is using as well because it reinforces is that that drug using behavior Um, but I think fundamentally the the thing about an addiction is it it is an illness Um, it is something that people really struggle to to deal with Um, it it seems that some people are more prone to develop um, dependence on substances or or behaviors um, than other people Um, and once the once someone gets involved in in using a substance or, or a repetitive behavior then their brain changes over time to make that uh, the reinforcement they get from a substance or a behaviour more rewarding um, and, become, and, and that increases this vicious circle of, of the drug becoming um, uh, the primacy in, in the life to, to the detriment of all other um, aspects of somebody's life. 
You're listening to The Voice of Russia with me, Juliet Spare, and joining us today is consultant on addiction psychiatrist Tim Williams, blogger and drugs policy analyst at the Centre for Policy Studies, Cathy Gingell, Marcus Connolly, not his real name, and we've disguised his voice, who's a known drug dealer and user, and Harry Shapiro, the Director of Communications and Information at Drugscope. Harry. There, there are some kind of wider issues here, I and mean, I know that this particular case is that is, is the hook for the discussion. Um, but I think, I mean, in general, you get stories um, more about kind of young people and, 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 and kids getting into this who come from well-off backgrounds. And it's like the headlines are always like something along the lines of they had everything they could wish for, but still this happened. And what you don't often get, I mean, you hear about the, you know, the yachts and the cars and the parties and the holidays and all the rest of it. But quite often, uh, if, you, if you're able to get below the surface of that, you often find that's just a compensation for a lot of things that's missing in these young people's lives. And it could be physically absent parents. It can be emotionally absent parents. Um, and if you have too much money, um, it, it's kind of the freedom to do nothing. I mean, if you've got no... If you don't need to have aspirations, hopes, dreams, because everything's given to you on a plate, that might sound very attractive to people listening to this broadcast, like, wouldn't that be great? But it might be great for a few months, but then, you know, life is just a big void and people get very bored and frustrated uh, and look for things to fill their time with. And if you're part of a party crowd, you know, uh, some there's an... Ev- element of inevitability that can follow and then you get the tragic stories I, I agree I'd call it I agree entirely with Harry it's, it's the neglect of affluence and I think one of the big problems with affluence is often the parents aren't exhibiting self-restraint either um, they're living a pretty heady lifestyle um, and I think the rich in a way I think addiction is an, a, a, what's it called a, no, a, a, a disease of all um, classes it's just that they're fewer rich people and they're more poorer people but I I think for richer people, the exercise of self-restraint and self-discipline in a curious way may be as hard as it is when you're poor and you've um, got absolutely nothing. And I think it does come back to this fact of the early check on behaviour. And if those checks aren't put in place with the requisite love and support, um, the brain does get into a very bad way. It is affected and it is more... That's why I think we need really strong interventions early on and not leave this idea that you're going to live out some life cycle of addiction, which has been prevalent in this country in the past. I'd like to come to Marcus, but just before I do that, I know, Tim, what, what are your feelings on early intervention from what Cathy's just said there? I mean, I agree. I think um, dependent patterns can be set up from, from childhood. Um, and I think um, that impulse control is, is, a, is, is very important to, to, um, to, to develop, um, uh, you know, when you're um, growing up and um, to try and... Um, have the, the, the strength um, to, to deal with um, things that we find tempting. I mean, there, are, there is evidence that, that certain areas of the brain um, are affected by, by drugs and alcohol, and people who have certain areas of the brain that are, that are, um, are different from, from the normal population um, ha- are more prone to develop dependence. So I think there's a nature and a nurture here. We, we, we certainly know there's a genetic risk factor for, for drug and alcohol dependence, um, but there's also a very strong nurture um, d- component in terms of uh, modelling behaviour. There are you know, a lot of um, uh, children of, of drug and alcohol um, addicts who will go on to develop um, drug and alcohol themselves, and, and not all of that can be explain, explained by genetics. There's, there's very good twin studies to show that when you adopt twins um, outside of a of a drug and alcohol using environment, they both have an increased risk of, of dependency. So we know from that there is a genetic risk, but there is also certainly a modelling behaviour and, a, and, and uh, an environmental risk um, for, for drug and alcohol misuse. Now, Marcus, you've agreed to talk to us today. We've changed your voice and this isn't your real name. Could you tell us what drugs you take? I've used cocaine quite a lot, quite a lot in the past. And I've gone out and uh, I've just been... Uh, like really heavily involved in the party scene over the years. So, but living in London, I've got, I've got to like uh, see a uh, lots of different walks of life, like from the like from proper street kids to like more 
obviously for people from more affluent backgrounds. We're going, we're going back to the question point about uh, Everardin, but uh, I was just going to say, like, where her, where her wealth and like lifestyle was was like was was so like and obviously they were uh, uh, to a billionaire spot, uh, to, uh, to being a billionaire that uh, there would be like just think lack of sympathy from the people around her I think and, and that's like and that's where I think a lot of a lot of rich people like don't get the help that they need because the, the people around them would think oh they've got enough money to sort it out but uh, but yeah I've been been involved in in Colton in London for, for about a decade. How easy to get is it to get your hands on it? I wouldn't, I would, like, um, like a really more question issue, I think, is like, it's, it's really not, to get, to get a hold of actual good cold care, it's, it's, really, it's really quite hard, like, and a lot, a lot of it is, like, really, really, really bashed up. But, like, uh, things, things, like things like crack are a lot, a lot easier to get hold of. You can pretty much get it on any, any street corner. And then that's, and that's the other thing as well, like, with, with cock and crack, there's such a fine line, like, if you've got really good cock and you get invited to, like, cool parties or whatever, but if, if you're smoking crack, you're more likely to be in, in squats and that, even though essentially it is um, but Would you say there's a typical crack user? Uh, sorry, I, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't make just a sort of wild generalisation to say this is like a stereotype, but I'd say more often than not that few people that use use crack like do follow a certain there are in 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 my experience people that have that have been occasional crack users but they've they've usually been pretty in control of their life to be an occasional crack user. Whereas like uh, uh core pain users are co- completely across the board, like right? all walks of life. Harry, does in terms of drugs at the moment, then, what what seems to be the most threatening drug to society? If Marcus says, you know, you can get crack cocaine on every street corner, but cocaine is, good cocaine is, is excluded for those on the London party scene. I think the most damaging drug for Britain at the moment is alcohol, if you really want to know. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of illegal drugs, um, I mean, they, they, they all carry their risks. I think it's misleading to start putting things in kind of league tables of harm. But clearly, I mean, drugs like heroin and crack cocaine, the drugs that are most likely to cause the most problems of addiction uh, and dependency and, and to get people to the point where the only thing they're concerned about is where the drugs are coming from and when they're going to use and how they're going to buy. Uh, bearing in mind, of course, if we're talking about people who are wealthy and affluent, they're not going to be handing around on street corners. Um, I mean, these days, you know, for the people, if you know what to do, you know, drugs are only a mobile phone call away and people will deliver to you. Um, so they're in a very different space in terms of acquiring drugs uh, than, than normal street users. Um, but I think the drugs that that officially tagged as problem drugs like crack and heroin yeah are still by and large the drugs that are likely to cause most chaos to individuals and families and communities i think this is the wrong way to look at it completely i think it's absolutely stupid to begin to rank drugs and it completely um belies what addiction's about you will see where people are prescribed the purest heroin they will still go out and get their crack cocaine and drink alcohol the idea that drug addicts don't use alcohol is ridiculous the idea that a lot of alcoholics actually don't dabble in drugs is ridiculous the nature of addiction and the nature of addicts is that you always want more and therefore your whole behavior becomes risky therefore you need to reverse the way we look at this to say that problem drug use is the only problem we shouldn't let it get to problem drug use it certainly begins with drugs that are considered soft which in themselves have quite psychoactive Um, um, effects in the brain like cannabis and this is where it starts cannabis can trigger schizophrenia not necessarily but we don't know the predisposition in children for schizophrenia I certainly know at least three boys whose lives are permanently damaged they're walking vegetables from heavy drug use involving heavy cannabis and cocaine use when they were young so I and the fact that they don't die doesn't mean that they're not standing over their mother's bed with a knife in the night when they've gone off their medication so I think this is completely the wrong way to look at it any notion of ranking it just simply doesn't understand addiction
I mean, I completely agree with Harry. I think um, alcohol is by far um, and and above the most harmful um, substance in the UK. Um, I mean, the other, the drugs, we've actually had a reduction in in heroin use, reduction in in cannabis use since it was declassified and uh, unfortunately reclassified um, again in uh, later on, um, there, there is no evidence of, that cannabis causes schizophrenia. That's, uh, that's not the, causes, that's but it's that high association and it increases the risk. If you look at Professor Murray's work at King's College, if you read that carefully, and it causes um, high potency skunk as associated with first episode psychotic um, I incidents. Think Robin Murray is, is on his own in, in that. Respect. I wonder why he's been knighted and made a serve. He's so on his the own. Way. I don't think that's true. I've met a lot of addiction psychiatrists who and I've gone recently through all the research on cannabis um, for a journal and there is really a substantial corpus of evidence. Well I think the biggest the biggest weight of evidence is cannabis use has increased in the UK um, dramatically over the last 30 years and the rates of schizophrenia has actually reduced. So well not if you look at the would, South East London would, study. Kathy let would, him speak a second. Yeah. If there was if there was any link between cannabis and schizophrenia, then there would be a there would be this is a massive population data. You cannot ignore millions of people um, taking cannabis. There would be a, a following rise in schizophrenia. So we can we can pretty confidently rule out the link between cannabis and schizophrenia. So uh, having said that, you know, cannabis in pe- for people with psychosis, then cannabis can be dangerous because it can precipitate psychotic relapses, much as anything else that, that causes stress in somebody's life can. So that's that's the the fundamental thing that we were we were answering here. Um, and alcohol itself is is the most harmful drug. And you talked about cannabis being a gateway into other into other drugs. But that that again is not true. Um, alcohol is often the first substance that is that is used by people. That is the first gateway into all of all drugs. So we need to we can't think about. I agree. You can't think about um, uh, you know classifying drugs, uh, illegal drugs, against each other. But we also need to consider alcohol as coming into this, into the picture. And if we keep alcohol as, as a legal substance, which which of course it will be um, kept as a le- uh, as a legal substance, then we need to have a much more rational um, view about drug policy. If, if we if we legalise one substance, then we are legitimising um, use of of all substances. And therefore, we must have a much more um, uh, thoughtful um, in, uh, way of looking at drug harms. I mean, if you look at the Portuguese and the Dutch experiment, where they have decriminalised personal possession of drug use, there's been a, a reduction in the rates of drug use and, and the drug-related harm. And that's a much more sensible way to look at current drug policy rather than to increasing legislation, which has been shown throughout the years to have a detrimental effect on, on drug use and drug-related harm. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spare, and I'm joined by consultant addiction psychiatrist Tim Williams, Director of Communications and Information at Drugscope, Harry Shapiro, blogger and drugs policy analyst at the Centre for Policy Studies, Cathy Gingell, and Marcus Connolly, who agreed to take part if we changed his voice and name. You've heard what's been spoken about. Does this influence the way you use drugs in any way or the way you'd turn to drugs in the future knowing what harm it does do to you or does it matter is it just the party scene you want to be involved with it's, it's not it's not just the party scene Some, sometimes we all we all have ways of self-medicate and you know like my mother she makes she makes a cup of tea or i like, i don't know we all have our different rituals and that going back to what we said before that i was like i, I wholeheartedly agree with um, yeah, Tim, yeah, alcohol's def- definitely been the, the main gateway drug. And if you have a few drinks, it always makes you, up, you, you think everything else is a great idea. We've gone on with what we're saying in Portugal. I've got friends, friends out there and friends in, in Holland as well. And when, when I'm out there, the crime levels, the general death the life, life of people out there, they do seem a hell of a lot happier than us. Harry, what's your reflection on, obviously, alcohol? being classed as as one of the most harmful well i mean i think you know if you just look at sort of bald statistics on kind of drug deaths you know you've got tens of thousands of alcohol related deaths and it isn't just kind of overdoses Mm -hmm. like you you get with drugs it's kind of long-term health problems Uh, i mean they're known to everybody it's no big big surprise to say you know alcohol and you know tobacco combined put all the drug deaths kind of well in the shade um 
But, you know, we do have changing attitudes to tobacco. Um, far fewer people smoke these days than used to. Uh, it's much harder to smoke in public now than it used to. So it is possible, you know, with a combination of kind of education and legislation um, and kind of just culture, really, to, to change people's attitudes to substance misuse without, you know, going to one extreme or the other. We, we are creeping onto legislation here. Mm. And I know, Cathy, in a blog you wrote, you, you mentioned that in London, Ava Rousing and Hans were able to pursue the, the drug adult hedonistic lifestyle that would not have been tolerated in Sweden. Certainly wouldn't. But can I just come back on the alcohol? This is sort of a bizarre argument because we've liberalised all our alcohol laws and we've expanded licensing capacity so dramatically. So it's the liberalisation of alcohol that's caused the problem. So I don't know whether Harry now wants to prohibit alcohol. I certainly believe we're far too liberal with alcohol, but I'd also put it to you that the number of drug of alcohol deaths compared with the number of people in the population taking alcohol isn't disproportionate to drugs. In fact, the number of drug deaths is rather higher. Um, but to come back to Sweden, um, Sweden experimented with an extremely liberal uh, approach um, of effectively decriminalising drugs in the late 60s, early 70s, I think, if I have to get this right, and it was an absolute disaster. So Sweden's gone through this process and then decided they would take a much more restrictive approach, which has been very successful, particularly in keeping young people off drugs. And their alcohol problem, by the way, is not bigger than ours. Again, Holland, this is ridiculous. 76% of the municipalities in Holland have a zero-tolerance drug policy because they have devolved government. There are no cannabis cafes in 76% um, percent of Dutch municipalities. Cannabis isn't actually decriminalised. The cafes are being closed down rapidly because they're not wanted there because they attract so much crime. And the Portuguese data has been absolutely spun out of proportion by the Cato Institute that was highly selective in their use of statistics. So, you know, there's, there's sort of lies, damn lies and statistics in all of this, and it makes debate very, very difficult. I think you. the other problem with a lot of this is that people try, and whether it's Sweden or whether it's Portugal, they try and superimpose one culture on top of another, and it's, it's very difficult to do that. Um, quite often when you have particular drug epidemics or panics in America, people assume that the next thing that's going to happen is that we're going we're gonna to get the same thing. And quite often we don't. I mean, various drug epidemics in America never appeared here at all for all sorts of reasons to do with, with culture availability and, and, and a whole range of issues. So I think it's more complicated than just assuming that because something appears to work in one country, that it will automatically work here, whether it's a regime that's more restrictive or more liberal. Are we doing enough about addiction, though? We've talked about, you know, the drugs laws, the legislations and the culture of drugs. And we've mm. heard from Marcus and why he's involved. You know, what do we understand addiction? Does this story of Ava Rosing on the headlines and in the newspaper almost every day help society understand what needs to be done about addiction? Mm. Tim? I think we are, as a society, very poor in funding um, research and um, help for people with, with um, drug and alcohol dependency. And the most fearful, um, worrying some data is that um, you know, the, the funding for alcohol addiction is, is dwarfed by, by drug funding, whereas the, the harms from alcohol are so much more. For example, we have a 500% increase of, uh, of liver-related deaths, 85% of which are directly due to alcohol in this country, whereas all the other causes of death, cancers, heart disease and diabetes, have been pretty much the same over the last 30 years. So there's a national epidemic of people dying from, from alcohol disease. Um, 500 percent and if you know if if diabetes deaths had increased by 500 percent over the last 30 years there'd be a national outcry there'd be government strategies to introduce better diabetic care so so why is it this not happening with with alcohol and, and i would say this is this is the alcohol industry they're extremely good at um at obfuscating uh, um data about mm -hmm. alcohol and and um uh, making the the message about alcohol confused 
So fundamentally, we don't do addiction very well in this country. Um, we need much more funding, and particularly that much that needs to be focused on alcohol misuse. And we have to have the policies to to go, to to follow that. Um, funding for for treatment is is almost like. Um, uh, shutting the gate after the horse has bolted. We need, government needs to set an example. They need to be much more clear. I, I completely agree with Cathy that we need to be more restrictive on alcohol. The Swedish experiment on alcohol is, is, is very good um, in terms of reducing the, the availability of alcohol and increasing the price. That's the fundamental thing. That, that will do much more than any treatment um, that we can do in, as, as addiction specialists. Um, for a, on a population level, and I agree, there needs to be a rationalisation. We need to increase the the the, um, the restrictions on alcohol and, and think about drug policy in a in a more innovative way. What positive lessons can the media, the government, teenagers, addicts, and society learn from this death? Because it has had a lot of column inches. Well, it, it has, but you know, um, although everything's online these days, it's still going to be tomorrow's chip paper. I mean, to be honest, I think it's it's a sensational story. Um, if it was, you know, a couple in a housing estate in Grimsby, nobody would take a blind bit of notice, really, apart from the local newspapers, possibly. Um, but the fact that they're kind of this, this kind of bizarre situation of like, you know, a, a, a billionaire couple squirreled away in a rich house smoking crack, of course, is is sensational for the media. But what you learn from something like that in terms of general addiction policy or treatment or anything like that, I think is, is minimal. I'm not sure I agree. I think you learn socially that no drug use is safe drug use and you learn how easily it can escalate. And we live in a very tolerant society about drug use and I think especially for children, adults have got to get a bit more real. Adults who are using drugs who have to children have got to learn a bit more restraint. We are a culture of excess in all ways. We demand immediate gratification for everything and the law effectively allows us to do it. So I think it really means as a society we need to take a long hard look at how we proceed and whether we can afford to be so lax and liberal. Tim, finally, do Colin Inch has written about addiction help, help us understand it? I mean, anything that highlights the dangers of addiction is, is useful. I think sometimes it can be, it can be difficult when it's a, a sensationalist story um, such as this. I mean, you know, for example, the, the media very, very much focus on anything that's related to ecstasy, but very minimise um, um, reporting on anything related to alcohol and, and heroin. So there's lots of heroin deaths or, or, or other, you know, substance deaths in the UK um, and they don't get picked up on in, in the media but I think you know any any opportunity for us to, to have a debate like this and highlight the importance of addiction in our society is, is a useful tool for, for a, such a tragedy. Marcus a final word from you. If they have, if they have a, a, a tendency to be an addict it needs to be addressed early on like rather, rather than just saying it's society's fault or it's the money's fault or anything I think the people around, we all need to be responsible for each other in that respect. And I think that's the one lesson we can take for it, is that we should, no matter how rich or privileged that we think people are, people do, do suffer in their own ways. So I'd like to thank all my guests for joining me today. The consultant addiction psychiatrist Tim Williams, Director of Communications and Information at Drugscope, Harry Shapiro, and Drugs Policy Analyst at the Centre for Policy Studies, Cathy Gingell, and Marcus Connolly, who agreed to take part on the Voice of Russia today. Thank you very much.